So tonight, uh, also, I, I joined the guild before we had the shop. And uh, since we've had the shop, the question comes up every now and then, uh, well, why don't we have a lot of good equipment there, but why don't we have lathes? That's not really for tonight's discussion, but maybe after tonight, you'll have a better feel what we need to do if we want to have a lay in the shop, uh, what has to, has to happen. It's just probably never gonna happen in the current shop just because of space and other reasons. So uh, we have three local turning clubs. Uh, Northwest Wood Turners is uh, I'm president of uh, Northwest Wood Turners. And the present presenters tonight are uh, members of the uh, of that club, and that's what we're going to talk about. So let me uh, start here. Everybody see that? Yep, I can see okay. it. So why turn? So that's our agenda tonight is to anyone who's thinking about being a, uh, doing something, expanding on your woodworking skills, uh, turning is, is a good logical next step for a lot of people. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to pick a lathe, uh, how do you hold equipment on, on that lathe, what tools you need, how to keep them sharp, and what, what do you do to finish a product? And then at the end, I have a, a list of local and online resources that we highly recommend. So getting into a lathe, you need a, uh, obviously you'll need the lathe. The lathe comes with a, just very basic uh, accessories, a tool rest, a face plate, to uh, hold stuff on there, tailstock, and uh, John will cover all what all these things need in the in the next presentation. <clears throat> but also, you need uh, just as important as the lathe is. You need something to keep your tool sharp, and um, so consider uh, a grinder. If you have a high speed grinder, that can work, but we recommend a, a slow speed grinder. And Dave's going to cover um, what it takes to keep your tool sharp, uh, what basic tools, and then um, uh, your PPE, just as we have uh, requirements for uh, safety things in the shop today. Uh, turning also has the uh, basically the same stuff. So the first thing you you really need to consider when uh, when you're getting into turning is, is what kind of things do you want to make? And we're going to go over um, different aspects of turning. Probably what uh, a lot of people will start with is simple stuff. And this is how I started uh, with my first lathe is uh, just making basic pens. And I remember seeing uh, handmade pens uh, when I've done traveling and they just look really cool and they're pretty easy to make. There's a, uh, you start out with a kit and uh, the link there I have um, is a, a very cost effective way of getting into, uh, they offer all kinds of pen kits, uh, standard ones like you see down here, specialty ones. Uh, and this is, there's just been a, a explosion of specialty pen kits that have come out everything for firefighters, policemen, and then we have a uh, gun, gun kits and stuff like that. Roger, let me just interrupt. The, the, all this PowerPoint presentation is gonna be available on our website. So the links and everything will be available. So you, you don't have to write furiously to get these notes. Absolutely, thanks. So the thing about turning pens, it's really minimal tools and equipment's needed. And, um, you know, I've taught, uh, you know, young kids how to make a pen. And so it's, it's a good first step. The thing about this and other things in turning is you get instant gratification. You can make a pen in less than an hour. Uh, a lot of um, woodworking projects, as you all know, you know, you're, sometimes you talk about, you know, weeks, months, several months to, uh, to make a product. 
a lot of times in turning uh, that weekend, you can finish finish something. And they make and things like pens make fantastic gifts. In fact, the joke in turning is, you know, there's only so many bowls and platters that you can give to your family. So they stack up in your garage. So basically, uh, just simple tools, a parting tool, scraper, a gouge, uh, a pen jig is very, very simple, sandpaper, and then you finish it. Uh, then the next step for a lot of people is they want to get into uh, bowls. And... Um, uh, bowls are very popular. Uh, if you're into selling your 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 stuff, uh, they sell quite well. There's two ways of turning a bowl. The most common way is what we call a twice turn bowl. And the easiest wood to turn is green wood. Uh, it turns, uh, as people say, it just turns like butter. So the optimal way of turning is as soon as you get that tree down, you cut the uh, cut it into um, uh, rough logs. You seal the end, uh, take it home, and then you uh, you cut it round out of the log and rough it out to um, commonly about an inch to an inch and a half um, diameter um, side. And then you uh, seal the end grain and just set it aside for uh, uh, several months. Uh, sometimes uh, it can take up to a year to get the moisture content down to, uh, to where it's dry. If you don't do that, as we all know, wood moves a lot and um, you'll get uh, warpage in the bowl or more commonly you'll get cracks in the bowl. Now you can do what uh, once turn bowls, and a lot of people, a number of people, will do that. Somebody's asking, how do you seal the ends? We use a, um, it's what we what we use is uh, most people use what they call anchor seal, and uh, it's a waxy substance. Uh, there's a lot of cheap ways of going. Some some people just use latex paint, but. Uh, uh, NC, anchor seal is a, is a very good um, sealing. And you only need to seal the end, the end grain. The side grain, some people will do, but uh, really the, the, when a bowl, when a wood dries, it's coming out of the end grain and that's where you want, want to slow things down. And tools um, basically can get away with the bowl gouge and a scraper. And we'll be talking about tools uh, shortly. So basically, when, when we think about turning, we're, we're thinking about two different categories of turning, bowls and spindles. And spindles are where you're cutting mostly side grain. And as you see there, uh, a tool handle is a very good example of, of uh, spindle turning. And the, um, the cutting side grain, you're using a gouge, but it's called a, a spindle gouge. And it's a little bit different in architecture. But basically you're going to uh, take a square piece of wood, make it round, and then make whatever uh, uh, item that, you're, that you wanna make. The goblets there are another example of uh, spindle turning. They're a lot of fun. You'll see a couple of them there where you have, a, especially for weddings, these are uh, uh, rings that you make out of the, uh, out of the piece and in a piece like like this with a ring, that's all that all starts from from a blank like this. It's a solid piece of wood, and uh, you um, just uh, make it out of one piece of wood. So um, that's the next step for a lot of people. And then you get into a little bit more complicated items like hollow forms. They can be boxes. Uh, urns are a pretty popular thing for, uh, for some people to make. Um, hollowing takes a little bit more advanced skills. For, um, for larger items, if you want to hollow, you need some kind of jig because when you have a tool, when you have something that's fairly deep that you need to uh, hollow out, um, your tool is hanging way over the tool rest and the, um, there's just no support there. So you need some kind of jig to, uh, 
to hold the tool so that you can hollow out uh, things like this. Um, but these are just some examples of, of hollow forms, bases, um, and so on. And again, they're, they're uh, what I call sort of specialty items. Hollow forms, then we go to uh, platters and plates. You can uh, make them functional or decorative. You know, this is an example of some sushi plates that, uh, that I've made. You can make them round, you can make them square. Uh, you can also decorate them with, uh, we'll talk a little bit about embellishments, but this is, this is just a, a fairly flat platter that uh, has been engraved with a rose. <clears throat> and the engraving and the, uh, the perimeter here, that's all crushed stone. And um, so you, you uh, carve this out with a, a power carver. You fill it with, you crush your stone, fill it in there, and then just soak it in, in a CA glue and then sand it down to, uh, to flat. Um, there's a lot of embellishments that you can make. This is uh, a, a piece of figured wood that's been dyed with several different colors of dye. And it's a way to really bring out the figure in, uh, in figured wood. So uh, there's actually a video I think I shared with the project build group that um, how to do uh, videos like this, how to do uh, how to take dyes and figured wood and make it look really, really, really pretty. And then you get into uh, uh, spheres and, and eggs and things like that. Uh, again, more advanced techniques. The, the, the challenge with a, a, a round sphere is how do you hold it? How do you chuck it? How do you hold it uh, on, the, on the lathe so you can, can cut that? Uh, there's a joke in turning that how do you make a three inch sphere? And you start with a four inch sphere and keep working till it's round. Um, these are some examples of uh, some baseballs that I've made. Uh, you start with a, a plain uh, sphere made out of plain uh, wood. These are mostly maple. And then you use pyrography to uh, burn in the stitches. Uh, this is an example of trying to uh, color uh, first of all, uh, start with a round item, make it uh, into the shape that you want, and then uh, use dyes or whatever coloring technique that you want to use to try to make it look, uh, look real. Uh, this also, in addition to the coloring, I uh, used the stippling to, uh, to make the, uh, the texture on the, uh, on the orange. And the whole concept of embellishment and turning is, is a huge deal. And there's just a lot of uh, things that you can do there. And then there's uh, things like wall art. Yeah. Wall art is whatever you want to do. Uh, a lot of times wall art uh, uses what we call offset turning, where uh, Tom will be talking about turning between centers where everything is, uh, is is symmetrical and offset turning is, is where you, you hold it at an angle and you get some really, really uh, unique effects from that. Uh, sometimes you just you can use junk wood. You can see here, it's just a piece of uh, wood that you probably don't, wouldn't know what to do with unless you've got a good imagination and turn it into uh, something that looks pretty cool. But it's an opportunity to you can just let your imagination run wild. When you turn stuff, you, you need to think about: Do you really are you looking for functional pieces? Or are you looking for things that um, are more artistic? And these are some examples of things that uh, look nice. I don't know that they're useful for anything, but. These were uh, examples of, of uh, some work that I did that just has some uh, epoxy in there that I didn't know what to do with this center here. Some coloring techniques. This is both uh, dyes and waxes. Uh, a little uh, goblet-like form. And then taking a, a beautiful piece of burl 
and making it into um, just something you can put on the counter for uh, holding your keys or whatever. Um, so that's, as you get into feeling comfortable making the forms, then the next step is to see what you can do to really embellish them and, and uh, use different techniques for, uh, for doing that. Uh, these are some other examples. Uh, pyrography is wood burning. You can paint things. You can carve uh, items. You can make inlays, uh, fuming. Uh, actually, you can fume furniture. Uh, but there's just a lot of things that you can do to, um, uh, once you get tired of making bowls and platters and pens and things, then you can sort of jump into um, doing more artistic, unique stuff. Roger, somebody wants to know what fuming is. Fuming is a, uh, a chemical technique that you can take, especially oak and, uh, how do I explain that? You, you, you wrap, you uh, put it in a, a tight seal environment. You, you uh, put this on um, the chemical in there and it turns the wood uh, dark. Uh, you probably know what fuming is. Maybe that's, you can do a better explanation of that, Ed. But. Uh, is it done with the, is, are we talking about ammonia? Yeah. So you just in, in, enclose the wood in a environment that's high in, high in the ammonia vapors. Right. Exactly, and uh, I don't I don't do this much in turning, but uh, uh, I know some people do. And in addition to fuming, you can bleach wood. And some people will uh, just make the uh, take bleach, make the wood as white as possible, and then do other embellishments. And same with burning. Sometimes you can take a, a piece with a blowtorch and uh, uh, just make certain certain parts of it black. That's pretty cool. So why turn? It's a lot of fun. It's very addictive. Uh, talk to a lot of, I know for myself, once I started turning, uh, I did a lot of flat work. But when I started turning, it just is very addictive. And it's very relaxing. But it is dangerous. It can be dangerous. It does require training. And uh, it's not cheap to get started, but it can be affordable. Um, and I think after tonight, I, want, I hope that everyone comes away from this to get an idea of what, it's going to, what kind of investment it's going to take to uh, get into turning. You don't want to go cheap. Uh, you don't want to do a Harbor Freight type uh, entry into, the, uh, into, the, into it, but you don't, have to, you don't have to have a lot of high-end tools and stuff. So. That's uh, that's the end of, of my section. So the next section, uh, the way we're going to do this today is that we have uh, six sections that we're going to go through, and then at each one we'll have open it up for questions. And if there's no questions, we'll go on to the next one. So anybody have any questions before we move on to more meat? So John Beachwood, uh, he's a member of both clubs. Uh, he's a retired uh, Coast Guard guy and uh, does beautiful work. So John's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how to pick a lathe. Thanks, Roger. Now that Roger sold you on turning, we got to help you pick out what you need. So uh, I, I got a few things to consider when you're picking out a lathe, uh, but I don't I don't, it's not intended to be all inclusive because I'm sure there are things that, that are going to pop up along the way. But uh, if you do have questions when you're picking out your lathe, you know, call me or call somebody from Northwest and we'll probably help you out. So th the first thing you got to ask yourself is what are you going to use it for? Are you you're going to do the spindle work like Roger was talking about with pens and table legs and handles, uh, vases and boxes? or are you gonna do bowls and uh, non-spindle work? And the, the reason why that's important is uh, if you get a lathe, a small I'm lathe- I'm not seeing anything, is, is, there, is there a presentation? Am I sharing? Uh, I'm, I'm seeing it. it. I'm yeah. seeing it. 
What is their primary intended use is the question, is the slide I'm seeing. Yep. Okay, I'll reset. So the reason why it's good to know this up front is how strong is the lathe? You don't need a very big or powerful lathe to do spindle work, uh, but if you're doing bowls and cutting across end grain, that extra horsepower will come in handy. And then the other question is, where are you going to put it? Uh, a pair, I didn't think about this when I bought my first lathe, uh, but I did when I bought my second and my third. Uh, and lathes come in a lot of different sizes with regard to not only what they can turn, but what the footprint is. And a lot of the uh, bigger lathes will actually tell you in the spec sheet what the footprint of the lathe is. Uh, and then what power options do you want? Uh, 220, if you don't have 220 available, then you need to have at least a 15 or 20 amp 110 dedicated plug or else you will probably wind up tripping your breaker a lot. And uh, trust me, when you're doing that final last cut and the breaker trips, it can be frustrating. Uh, and then how much space do you have around the lathe? Uh, because you do need, you do need to have space around the lathe uh, to, to either remove your tail stock or or even just turning on the front of the lathe. Uh, some of the lathe options, this is a bench top lathe. This is one of the ones that Northwest just got. And this is considered a midi lathe. Uh, and it, it'll turn a 14 inch bowl and an 18 and a half inch spindle. And it comes with a one horse power motor. It's 93 pounds and costs 650 bucks brand new. Uh, there are some options that we'll talk about in a little bit that this lathe has that you may decide are necessary or optional. And this will fit on a bench top. The other thing to consider when you're figuring out where you're going to put your lathe is what the lathe height is. Uh, ideally, the center of the lathe should be about your elbow when you're standing with your arm crossed to, across your chest. Uh, if it's too high or too low, it will strain your back. Then we have the freestanding lathes, and this is uh, another one that Northwest has. Uh, this one uh, will turn a 16-inch bowl and a on a 44-inch spindle. Uh, this particular one has an option of being a 110 or a 220, just by switching out the plug on it, you can convert this from 110 to 220, uh, but this one runs $2,600. Then you have the bigger lathe, which is this one, which is a, a Powermatic, uh, and it's a two horse 220, and it runs about 4,000. But the other thing on this slide is the parts of the lathe. Uh, I wanna go over what, what exactly the, the terminology for the parts are. And as you can see here, the headstock is pretty much the heart of the lathe. This one has a guard on it. Not, not all lathes have a guard on it. In fact, I think the Powermatic is the only one I've ever seen that comes with the guard. And I don't know that the newer ones have it. So what do the numbers mean? When you see a lathe, you, you often see that they'll be sized 1236 one horse or a 2423 horse. And uh, I want to try to explain what those numbers mean so you know what your lathe will do. And I'm going to use the 2024 three horse because that's the one that's in my shop. So the first number being 20 is the distance between the, the center and, and your bed or your ways. But it's rated for 20, but if, you if you're going to cut the backside of this bowl, you're going to lose two inches for your banjo to slide under it. So a 20 inch, a 20, in this case, my 20 inch lathe effectively turns a 16 inch bowl in the standard position. 
The second number being 24 in a 2024 20, lathe is the distance from the, the spindle to the tailstock. And that's how long of a piece you can put in there. But that, that measurement is from this point to this point right here. And it doesn't account for a live center, a drive center, a chuck, or a face plate. So even though it says you may have 24 inches, you might not be able to get a full 24 inches in that standard piece on that standard bed. Horsepower is, how, how big a motor does it have? How much power does it have to drive? Uh, the bigger the lathe, normally the bigger the horsepower it requires. And uh, the majority of the projects, you can use a one to a one and three quarter, uh, just 120 amp, 120 volt, 15 amp. 20 amp is recommended most of the time. Uh, if, if you get, I think most people will say, don't ever get anything under one horse. One horse is, if you're going to turn bowls or, or hardwood objects, one horse is about the minimum. Uh, horsepower that you would need to, to safely turn it and keep the speed consistent. Uh, two horse and above will require, will require 220. And uh, it's useful for larger bowls, hollowing, uh, heavy non-round objects, and hardwoods. Uh, you normally see horsepower ranges anywhere from one horse all the way up to five horses, five horse and a specialty lathe but typically uh, between one and three. The next thing is what options should you get? And I always recommend making a list. What do you think you must have? And my must have list may be a little bit different than yours. Uh, reverse, if you're sanding while, you're on, while it's on the lathe, if you reverse the direction, uh, it will sand better and faster uh, a spindle lock, when you're removing your chuck off the spindle, if you don't have a good spindle lock, it makes removing the chuck extremely difficult. Uh, variable speed, I, I would say most turners would, would agree that that's a must have. And the reason for that is if you're going to put an at around object on your lathe, you don't want to start out at 600 RPMs. You want to start out at a much slower RPM until you get it into balance. John, um, on that speed control issue, I've seen some lays that just do it by changing the, the pulleys and the belts. What's the general consensus on that? Uh, yes. A, a lot of lathes, ha they have two speed zones. Uh, they have a high speed zone and a low speed zone. Uh, and, and some of the older lathes, it, they, it, it's either one, two or three positions on the belt that control your speed. And that's the only variation you have. Variable speed is usually done with a rheostat and, and you can go either in high range or you can go in low range. And your, your lower range belt may go down to 100 RPMs and up to 1200 and your higher range will go somewhere from 1000 to 3000. Uh, so variable speed that I'm talking about is an actual uh, rheostat controlled or, or digitally controlled speed. The, the one, two, three belt setups give you some options, but uh, my first lathe was a, a Jet 1236 that, ha that had that. It didn't have variable speed. It just had three belt speeds. And the first one was fast. The second one was scary fast. And the third one was you're going to die fast. So uh, I, I think for variable speed, I would go with a digital. Did that answer what you were asking? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, speeds, the minimal speed uh, 
on the on the must have list is like I said, 500 or lower helps you if you have an, an out of balance object that you're trying to get around. Uh, 3000 and higher, there's not a lot of people, a lot of people that turn at 3000 or higher. There are a few. And horsepower, like I said, one to one and a half. And, and you can do just about anything on spindles and, and some bowls. Uh, whether you want, if you want to go bigger, then you need to, uh, to get a bigger motor. And then the heavier the lathe, the better off it is for stability. Uh, if it's a heavy lathe and you're, and you're a little bit out of round, it doesn't walk over your shop. It stays, stays pretty solid. And a lot of people put weight bags on the bottom of their lathe just to hold it, uh, like to have things indexing uh some of the work that roger showed was done using an indexing where you can stop your where you can lock your spindle at different clock positions and do other work uh, another like to have is the headstock does it slide down down the ways to give you an option to turn on the end? Does it pivot out? Uh, those are options if you're doing larger or, or different shape objects that help. Uh, swing away or removable tailstock. Uh, when you're turning inside of a bowl, uh, getting that tailstock out of the way is extremely beneficial. And then there, there are lots of accessories that you can get for different types of turning, uh, like I said, indexing plates, uh, indexing wheels that you can add onto your lathe, and, and a lot of other things depending on what you want to do. So when you're looking to buy a lathe, uh, buying a new lathe, you know exactly what you're getting. Uh, you can pick your options, but sometimes that's, that's really not a, an, a best way to get started. Uh, used lathes can be a great bargain. My, my first two lathes were used lathes and they did great. Uh, but look at the condition. Uh, is the bed rusted? Make sure all the pieces are there. Uh, and, and that's, that, that's an important cue because, uh, knowing what pieces you need to have, if you're buying it, Make sure you know what you have to buy after it just to use it. Uh, the headstock bearing, that, that, that's probably the most, if it, other than the belt, that's probably the most likely part where you're going to have a failure is in that headstock bearing. And if it's loud or if you can grab that spindle and feel any movement in it, then it's probably going to need a new bearing. Uh, I have replaced headstock bearings. They're not that difficult. Uh, but it's still something that, that if you're buying a used lathe, you should know about. Uh, and then alignment. Make sure that the center of the headstock lines up to the center of the tailstock. Because if it doesn't, and you put a spindle in there, you're never going to get a, a perfect cylinder out of it because it's always going to turn at a taper. Uh, it, it's very difficult if you can't line those two centers up uh, Within, within a couple of thousands. Uh, and then is it an off-brand? If, if it's uh, an off-brand that you can't get parts for and something goes bad, then it, it becomes a paperweight. And then if you're looking for a used lathe, does it have everything on your must-have list? Uh, and then why is it being sold? Is it being sold at an estate sale because somebody upgraded or... Uh, or they just couldn't get it to work right. Oh. And, and that's your introduction. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so stop your share. And um, so now you've got your lathe, you know what you want to do. How do you hold that piece of wood on the lathe? And we have Tom Willing here to uh, walk us through that. 
Where'd you go, Tom? There we go. Okay, this segment. Uh, I guess, first of all, thank you guys for having us do this. Uh, we're all pretty passionate about wood turning and are happy to share information. And so we like a ready audience. Thank you very much. Um, this segment is all about how you hang on to your workpiece with the lathe so that you can make it rotate around the axis of the lathe and do your magic with the cutting tools. Um, the main objective is to rotate a workpiece on the lathe so that you can apply a tool to it and form the piece of wood. And there are two primary elements to how you do that. One is compression, which allows you to create friction. And so the machinery hangs onto the piece and rotates it. The tool is in a stationary position and cuts. Uh, in the words of one of my favorite wood turners, you let the wood come to the tool. So um, looking at the different fitments you can put on a lathe, uh, we've got spurs and drive centers. And we've got screws on screw chucks, and then we've also got screws on face plates. So all of these things are uh, used in one way or another. Uh, you can go to a four jaw chuck that grips a spigot that you've turned on the workpiece. And uh, that's almost essential, pretty universal for wood turning uh, in these days. Another way you can hold your work on the lathe is to bond it to a waste block. And you probably would only use that under special circumstances. Uh, I've seen guys use double stick tape. Don't like that one myself. Um, I've used a good quality hot melt glue for little things. And then there are assembled glue ups that you can use. Um, all of the bonded approaches to holding onto your work are vulnerable to potentially catastrophic failure. Uh, if you aren't careful, you can fill the air in your shop full of kindling and uh, it'll be too late to try to dodge it once that happens. So let's take a closer look at the headstock and tailstock. The headstock has got a couple of parts that are pretty important, but the most important one is the drive spindle. You can see, let's see, uh, you guys that I can see, uh, is my cursor moving around the headstock there? Can you see that? Yeah. Yep. Good, okay. So this is the end of your drive spindle. It has threads on the outside and a Morse taper on the inside. Common sizes that you'll see are uh, one inch by eight TPI and one and a quarter inch by eight TPI. Those are the most common ones you'll see in readily available machines out there, even old ones. Uh, there are threaded adapters available that you can get. Um, in the middle of this little guy here with a rule across it shows the backside of one of my chucks that has an inch and a quarter eight thread. But this adapter will uh, push that down to a one inch by eight thread. So I can put my, uh, all of my chucks will go on either of my lathes, even though they have different size spindles. Um, let's see here, did I get that? Oh, Morse taper, most common taper you'll see is a number two. And that's uh, fairly strong. We'll do most of the things you wanna do up to a 20 inch lathe. Uh, beyond that, your like is not to run into three inch more tape or number three more tapers. And that's just a function of uh, size makes them stronger. Let's look at the tail stock. Um, I've got some uh, faces over my, let's see if I do that. There we go. Good. Um, this is the tail stock, which you've seen from dis different angles in some of John's pictures. It has a locking screw on it that will lock this do goody in place. This is called your quill. It has a number two Morse taper inside it and will accept this fitment, which is called a live center. The center body does not spin, but the nose of the body, I'm sorry, the nose of the center does spin and there, these are all bearings in there. So as you apply pressure with a live center, You've got both the uh, less friction of, for spinning coupled with a nose that'll hold it on center. 
Uh, another handy piece of gear to have with both tail stock and head stock, particularly head stock, is a knockout bar. Every lathe should come with one. Uh, you will see, um, where did I go here? Um, this knockout bar is from my large lathe. I've got a Powermatic 3520C, uh, uh, sorry, B. This little guy with a red and gray handle comes from a Jet 1221 variable speed lathe. That's a MIDI. This knockout bar here is one I made for my old Rockwell because it came without one. So you really need knockout bars to uh, knock out a number two Morse paper, taper. I've seen people do it with crowbars and that kind of thing. And I don't think that's very good for your lathe. Puts a lot of scratches in your metal that I don't like. Uh, here we go. Here I thought we go. Hmm. Uh -huh. Okay, does everybody see that? Yep. Good, okay. Um, we'll give you a little more detail about Morse taper accessories. Uh, we'll start with drive centers. These two here are getting pretty common. Uh, when I started turning, you didn't have any such beast, but these are called step centers. They have a number two Morse taper. And what they do is they allow you to, uh, if you have a catch, uh, to save your uh, workpiece because it just cuts into the end grain and the machine keeps spinning and the work stops if you have a catch. That's a safety feature that uh, particularly when I'm teaching, I really like. You also can have uh, four um, ed, uh, forgotten what they call these, four spurs. Spur. Uh, this is a four spur drive center. It's got a point that allows you to put it exactly on center in your piece. And then it's got four drive spurs that give you the traction you need to spin the piece. This one here has two spurs and a center pin. And where you usually use one of these guys is uh, cross grain on like a bowl blank. If you have to uh, smooth the bowl blank to get it flat on one side, you'll use a drive center like this to get it going. Off to the right, you have uh, two live centers. You can see, there we go. And the point of this one, or the nose of this one, you can see a point. Here I've uh, separated the point from the nose of the other uh, live center so that you can see how it works. This is a uh, taper and I don't know what number taper that is, whether that's uh, a number one or not. I don't think it's big enough for a number one Morse taper. These two cones are made of aluminum. And the idea of having them made of aluminum is if you are doing a, a close tolerance cut, and you get your tool off into the uh, rotating live center, the aluminum will cut as opposed to taking the end off your chisel. Okay. The next thing that uh, fitment that you can put into a chuck is very handy, sorry, into a lathe is very handy. And that is a three jaw Jacob ch chuck. It allows you to turn your lathe into a horizontal boring machine. And it's uh, pretty essential for making things like pepper grinders and fitting uh, socketed things, putting pieces of wood together that you wanna come apart and uh, go back together again. It's very much like the one in your drill press. Uh, and in fact, you can switch them back and forth between the two if you wanna do that. As a number two Morse taper on this one, um, I mentioned the boring machine. What it is not good for, and please pay good attention to this, because a Jacob's chuck is designed to really hang on to a round steel rod that's been made into a drill or uh, a, some kind of Forstner bit. Um, it's not appropriate for wood because what it does is it just crushes the wood and then, ooh, there comes that kindling again. So uh, never try to spin wood holding it with a Jacob's chuck. So then we move on to some of the uh, more traditional and uh, some of the more recent inventions. We get into faceplates. Those have been around for a long, long time. 
They allow you to affix your workpiece to a faceplate, which then threads onto your lathe. We also have four jaw scroll chucks, which, allow, which uh, allows the jaws to move concentrically. So they move apart and together at the same rate. Um, I'm sure you've all seen collet chucks on a, a router and collet chucks are also available for use on a lathe. And then a really useful one, when all the inventions don't work, you go to a shop made fitment and I'll show you some of those. Um, metal turning chucks, just like a Jacob's chuck, no, no for wood. You'll crush the grain and that'll really give you problems. Okay, now we've got some detail on a faceplate. You can see in the left, the uh, female thread on the faceplate and the male thread on the spindle. And then the center image has the faceplate mounted on the spindle. And note that the bottom of the workpiece is very flat. What you don't want to do is try to uh, hold on to a rumply surface with a faceplate because you'll get inevitable vibration. And when you get vibration, you get fatiguing wood and fatiguing metal. And there you go with a flying kindling again. The advantage of a faceplate is that it allows you to work across the front of a bowl like the one you see mounted there. That's a, a 12 inch rule sitting in the bowl. Um, so uh, you can get across the front and you have access there, get the tailstock out of your way, do all kinds of things. Four jaw scroll chuck. They're too versatile not to have. Um, it's interesting how in human history, uh, we've invented really cool stuff to help us do things that we couldn't do before. And the four jaw chuck is most certainly one of them. Um, the four jaws, as I mentioned, will move concentrically in and out. In the image on the left, there is a piece of wood that has a spigot formed on the end of it. You do that as a spindle turning operation. It's uh, dovetailed and the jaws are dovetailed so that when they come together, they made up all the way around. You don't get crushed wood with uh, a four jaw chuck the way you would with say a machinist chuck. Uh, you can also take your uh, workpiece and uh, all of these guys are uh, fitments that I've made for turning something else, but the jaws on a scroll chuck will uh, grip in a recess. So you can expand the jaws into a recess or you can clamp them down around the spigot. And the image on the right shows you that uh, fitment in my hand in the middle uh, with the jaws expanded into the recess. Another uh, accessory to most chucks these days, and then you also see other forms of this, is uh, a uh, aggressive wood screw that will go into a hole in the bottom of a bowl, or uh, you start on the inside of a bowl to hold the bowl while you form the outside. And uh, that is a great way to hold on to bowls that aren't too big because they're very quick to mount and dismount you can take something off and uh, go do something with it and come back and put it on a lathe again. Uh, you can set up a production run of 20 bowls and it goes very fast. It's not, uh, I don't usually go over about 12 to 14 inches. And when I go that big, I slow the lathe down. Um, another nice set of, uh, accessories to have for your scroll chuck is a set of uh, cold jaws, which are fitted with rubber bumpers. And then it works just the way the uh, dovetail jaws work. You can expand it into the inside of a bowl if the bowl tapers in at the top, or you can hold it by the outside diameter of the bowl if the bowl tapers out. Um, I always get a little nervous if I don't have a little taper one way or the other, if it's just a cylinder. Um, a lot of times I will bring up my tailstock just for safety to keep it from popping off the lathe or popping out of the chuck. And it's not a high speed setup. Cold jaws and the Longworth chuck, which is a, a bigger version of 
what the cold jaws do are primarily for light finishing cuts and uh, sanding and finishing. So four jaw chucks give you a lot of options. All of these pieces here were done with uh, four jaw chucks. Um, you can do a lot better work if you can get across the front of a piece with a natural edge like that. I uh, turned uh, finials with using a four jaw chuck. This uh, table here in the uh, third from the left has the ring that came off the back of a large diameter bowl. And I used that ring uh, to make a table with a friend of mine whose name is Jen Ferranti. She does glass fusing. And uh, that piece came out really well, a nice piece of big leaf maple burl. This is a spectacular piece of uh, quilted maple that I did. That's about a 12 inch diameter jewelry box. So, uh, there are all kinds of things you can do and four jaw chucks will uh, take you into balusters and small architectural forms, all kinds of things. Uh, this guy you'll recognize as a collet chuck. And the main thing about a collet chuck is that uh, you wanna make sure that your uh, dowel portion of your workpiece uh, completely fills the collet so that the collet uh, is gripping wood all the way down. I like it to be anywhere from an eighth to three sixteenths proud of the bottom of the collet. And then you get a good grip all the way around and you don't get as much vibration, which will work a piece right out of a collet if, you're, if you don't pay attention to it. Sizes, you can get them uh, half inch down to quarter inch diameters. Um, I've seen jewelers lays with little tiny ones that go down to uh, 16th of an inch bits. Um, I don't think you'll get into that much with a wood lathe. Okay, here we've got shop build approaches. In the upper left, you can see I've got a block of wood that had a hole in it that I tapped with a one inch by, I'm sorry, an inch and a quarter by eight, inch, eight TPI tap. And now this will go onto my drive spindle and allow me to do a friction fit for finishing my spheres. And this one is one I made up special for a run of uh, inch and a quarter spear, spheres that I had to make. You can do the same thing to make yourself a cup chuck just by putting a spigot on the end of a workpiece and putting it in your fort jaw chuck. You can also make a Morse taper on the end of a spindle and push that into your drive center. And uh, here is the same piece seated in the Morse taper. And I've got a cup cut into the end of it made it up with another cup that fits the rotating nose on my live center. And now this sphere will not go anywhere unless I back off the quill and take the pressure off it and rotate it. Uh, let's see. Good. This is the last of me. I hope I haven't heard a lot of comments or anything, but uh, I hope you'll have some questions. Why turn? I find it expands your range of design solutions, makes for some interesting things. I enjoy the intellectual demands and rewards of applying a discipline, which wood turning certainly requires. Uh, be prepared for about a 50 50 balance between cost of your uh, lathe and cost of your accessories. Um, I'll uh, jump to the bottom there and say, get the absolute best you can get in your budget. Uh, it's heartbreaking to see somebody fall in love with wood, wood turning and then realize that they're gonna have to pay twice because they didn't uh, get good enough quality to begin with. Uh, you have a resource both within the membership of the guild as well as in Northwest Wood Turners and Cascade, Southwest Washington. There are a lot of good wood turners in this area. Uh, don't be shy about asking them to share what they know because we all enjoy doing that. And then I think the most important thing, especially if you're thinking in terms of uh, a production environment, 
uh, invest in training for yourself and your employees. It's well worth it. And uh, understanding save, savings of materials, savings on injury, uh, savings on heartache. So that's it for accessories from me. I will stop the share and take questions or let you go on. So any good questions for, uh, for Tom? There was nothing in the chat, so. Yeah, you know, holding your piece on the lathe, that's, that is so critical. And there's so many different options for doing that. Uh, there's also a lot of options for uh, screwing that part up and having something fly off the lathe, which all of us have had, had happen. So that's why uh, uh, your, your protection, your uh, face plate and um, glasses are just so critical because uh, if it doesn't fly off, there's also the option that you're cutting into a piece of wood. It's well secured, but there's a, a big flaw in the wood and a piece will come off, especially if you're working with a green wood and it has a lot of bark. So a face, face shield is just absolutely critical. So you've got your lathe, you've got your, uh, your, you know how to put stuff on. Now you need some tools. And we have Mike Meredith here. Uh, where's Mike? There you are. So I'm gonna spotlight Mike. Um, I got him. Okay, you got him. So over to you, Mike. Well, again, thanks for the invitation. Um, Wood turners are always happy to talk about wood turning. Although if you put two wood turners in a room, you'll get three opinions on almost anything. So you got your lathe, you, you started to figure out what you want to do. You need some tools to do it with. Now, every presentation should begin with a statement. This is how I do it, not the way to do it. Everything you've heard tonight is our opinion. They're usually pretty good opinions, but they're not carved in stone anywhere. So one of the things we need to get up front about tools is the obsession wood turners have about steel. Um, why do turning tools need to be of such high quality steel? And it comes from, if you turn a two inch diameter piece rotating at a thousand RPM, which is not very fast, you will cover one mile of distance in 10 minutes. Think about taking a block plane and trying to plane a mile of wood. That's what you're doing with a turning tool. So tools must be able to hold an edge much longer than other woodworking tools. And this is accomplished by the shapes of the tools, by the nature of the steel, or if you decide to take our sharpening class, we'll be happy to talk to you about all the different kinds of tool steel. The one thing you need to know up front is that Chinese high-speed high steel is an oxymoron. Um, steel from China is a danger to you and not worth your money. So how are you gonna choose a tool? Well, we've, we've differentiated so far wood turning into uh, spindle turning, bet between center turning and bowl turning. The tools are sort of divided that way also. Um, we've seen lots of pictures, but you haven't seen any wood turning yet. This is from a fellow named Steve the Wood Turner who I follow on Instagram. He's a production turner from Ohio, I think. And I just want you to see what the tool in the hands of someone that knows what's going on can do. Now, a production turner does this all day, every day, so you get really good at it. But that doesn't mean that you can't get really good at it, too. Mike, you're not sharing anything. Are you supposed to be? Hang on. Let's try that. There you go. There you go. Now, between center turning, we've talked about spindle turning. That's when the fibers of the wood are running parallel to the, the, the bedways. So the, the spindle turning, you're cutting mostly side grain. Ah, come on. Well, side grain. And this is the sort of thing, the turning you would do for 
producing table legs, chairs, handles, um, turn boxes, pepper mills, spheres. Or goblets. We didn't realize Tom had such big hands until I saw this picture. <laughs> so size is not a limitation. You can make big things and you can make small things. But these are all things that you would make between centers. Now, bowl turning or faceplate turning, again, deriving its name as a sort of a this old style um, attachment method. The, the bowl turning... The wood is mounted with the direction of the grains perpendicular to the, um, um, the axis of rotation. And you can see that we're, in this case, cutting through, down across, cutting end grain, side grain, end grain, side grain. It's going to take a different cut type of tool to make that sort of cut than it would be to do the between, uh, between center, the spindle turning. So let's talk about tools for spindle turning. How do you go about doing a spindle project? Well, first you got to take squared around. This is a turner, a production turner in the United Kingdom named Dave Dalby, um, who is a damn fine wood turner. Taken squared around in this case with a skew chisel. Next, you lay out the details. You make a story stick. Then you cut the details. Beads, coves, rings, fillets, pommels, flats, whatever you want. Now, this is going to be a table leg, and it's clearly sped up a little bit. The actual time to make this piece is five minutes. This is a guy that's picked up a tool before. You notice now he's put his skew chisel down, and he's picked up another tool. That's a spindle gouge. Now, we're going to talk about the family of gouges here very soon. And voila, a table leg. So what kind of tools do you need for spindle turning? That is the between center um, side grain turning. Well, for squared around, this is where you begin. A spindle roughing gouge. You notice it says spindle. You would not ever use this tool on a bull blank where you're turning end grain and side grain. Uh, this is the most common tool for that, that squared around transition. Uh, this is a continental gouge, which is actually sort of a, a predecessor of the spindle roughing gouge. Again, it's a, a, a cutting edge with a wide open route for chips to exit. You'll notice the spindle roughing gouge has a very large flute, this is called. Or squared around could be accomplished with a skew chisel. This one is flat. It's not the, uh, the round chisel that that uh, Steve and, and Dave were using. Um, all of them will get you from square to round. All right, for laying out your, your turning, a pencil to make a mark, but most of your, most of your details will come from cutting a, a groove in the wood. Very often you'll use a caliper to do that. A parting tool is a tool that's just very good at making thin cuts so that you can mark a place where your bees will begin and end, where your cove will begin and end. Um, you can also do that sort of thing with a skew chisel also. Now the, the parting tool, as the name suggests, is a tool that allows you to actually part the wood off from the, from the pieces holding it in the, the, um, in the lathe itself. So it's a, a tool that has, has many functions. Cutting details. Well, how are we going to do that? This is the spindle gouge that we saw Dolby pick up. You'll notice that it has the cutting edge and a flute. The flute is not as, as deep as we saw for the spindle roughing gouge uh, or the continental gouge. So this is going to be one of the tools that you will, you will use to make your beads and coves and details. Uh, you can also do these with a skew chisel. Some people can do these with a skew chisel. It's a good idea to learn how to use the skew. And then finally, a tool that we don't talk very much about, and that's a scraper. Scraper is an old school tool. And despite what some might say, 
it's neither a mortal or a venal sin to use a scraper on a turning project. They are good, effective, and the new ones, this is one from D-Way Tools up in Issaquah, um, with the, uh, the negative brake scrapers, do an excellent job. Uh, they're cost effective and very flexible. So let's talk about the family of gouges for a minute. We saw the spindle roughing gouge that has the very large flute. And the purpose of the flute is simply to get the chips out of the way. You see the edge, the sharpening edge, a very simple bevel and a very simple shape. Uh, a detailing gouge, this is what a spindle gouge is called in Europe. We could call this a spindle gouge. Again, there's your cutting edge. The shape of the cutting edge is a lot more intricate than if the spindle roughing gouge. So sharpening that one is gonna be a little harder than sharpening that one, just because you have now a shape in two dimensions. And then finally, the bowl gouge that we saw working on the, um, uh, the bowl. Again, a flute and a cutting edge and a shaped um, bevel that actually is an important part um, of the function of the bowl gouge. And when we talk about sharpening, we'll talk a little bit about how you put those shapes into the, uh, into the gouge. Um, the flute of a, of a bowl gouge will be, some are straight-sided, a V-shape. Um, I think the, the ones that are more preferable are elliptical or parabolic, just because they're easier to sharpen. Um, the spindle roughing gouge can have a circular shape or it can be somewhat parabolic. The spindle gouge, the shape of the flute is always some segment of a circle. This is what defines the spindle gouge, having actually a truly round, uh, round flute. And, and these will come in. Do these come in, uh, do they have make these with carbide tips or are they all high speed steel? These are all high speed steel. We'll talk about carbide if we must later on. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now you got your lathe, you got your tools, or you got your, you decided what you want to do. How do you go get tools? Well, you could walk into Woodcraft, get out your, your credit card and, and just let her rip. Or um, we would, I would hope that you would sort of look into other cost-effective ways. I know turners that have started out and not far into the project decided this is really not something they want to do. So that outlay of cash in the beginning hurts a lot less if the outlay is a little less and you decide, nah, not such a good idea. Um, but look for used tools. Estate sales, club auctions, Northwest Woodturners has an auction in January. It's always a good source of tools. Garage sales, Craigslist. Um, there are places to find tools all over. You could go in and you could buy cheap tools. We spoke of the Harbor Freight uh, wood turning experience. Remember what I said about Chinese high speed steel? That's where these are coming from. Uh, you know, everyone, I hope that I say something to my grandchildren that they remember for 60 years. <laughs> my grandfather Whit, told me in 1960 cheap tools aren't a bargain, they're just cheap. And, you know, there, there are very few things that are true uh, indefinitely, and, but that's one of them. Tools can be chopped for, but you don't want to shop for, for low quality tools. So what tools do you need to get started? Well, again, it depends what you're going to do. If you're going to do spindle turning, you're going to need a spindle roughing gouge. You're going to need a parting tool, um, a three eighths to a half inch spindle gouge, and actually a half inch bowl gouge is a useful thing to have because you can use the bowl gouge to make many of the spindle cuts. How do you begin acquiring tools? Well, you can look for tool sets. This is uh, the birch handle and the red, red uh, labeling. It makes this a, a Sorby tool set. Um, spindle roughing gouge, bowl gouge, spindle gouge, oval skew, the third type of skew we've seen, um, a scraper, and a, a um, parting tool. Everything you need there to get underway. This uh, is $350 at, at Woodcraft. Uh, Sorby has been making tools literally for centuries and they're made from English M2 steel. M2 is sort of the, the basal tool steel. Um, anything less than that 
is not going to hold an edge as well. It's not going to last as long. So when you're looking for tools, you know, you find out what the steel is. Easiest way to tell whether it's a good tool steel or not is put it on a grinder and see what color the sparks are. Um, I'm going to have to back up a little bit on the Chinese. The Chinese can't make, make steel worth a damn, but they can make tools pretty well if they start out with good steel. These are pinnacle tools. Um, these, this, the English M2 cryo steel is made by the Crown Tool Company. Again, another English company that's been making tools for centuries. Cryo steel is steel that is cooled to almost liquid nitrogen temperature as part of the, the um, um, casting process. What it does is make very, very small unit cells within the steel itself, which means you can get a sharper edge and the edge is gonna last longer. So cryo treatment can take okay steel and make pretty good steel out of it for a price that's kind of in between. So the pinnacle set, spindle roughing gouge, spindle gouge, parting tool, and they throw in a, a skew and a, a, uh, a bowl gouge here. You know, this one is 190, this one is 350. Good quality tools in a set that has the tools that you need. So how do you really actually go about acquiring, getting the tools you want? Well, you can make a guess. What do you want to do? That's going to require some pretty good guesses on your part because your interests are going to change as soon as you start doing this. You're going to discover something you like. You're going to see a project you think is cool. And you're off down the rabbit hole in another direction. Um, as far as acquiring tools, the first best bet is find a, a, a set of tools at a sale. Okay. Rough and gouge, spindle gouge, parting tool, uh, and then you add the tools as, as your interests change, as your needs. Go ahead. And remember, at the beginning, you do not need every tool. That will come later. And that is not my complete set of tools. There's a bucket behind me, two buckets behind me full of tools. Mm -hmm. But, you know, someday there'll be a 12-step program for us, and we can all look forward to that you know, getting out of this sort of, or of sort of addiction. Now, the carbide tools are a new variety of tool that have come on the market um, in the last 10 years. They differ from the, the standard seal tool in that they have a carbide scraper um, in different shapes and different sizes. Um, the square one is a, would be your squared around. This is a sort of hollowing smoother cut. And this would be a substitute for your parting tool. So they are scra scrapers. Uh, they don't really cut. They remove the wood by scraping. Um, the advantage is you don't have to sharpen them. And that's one big expense at the beginning of the wood turning, pro wood turning hobby that you can defer to later. Carbide is very, very hard. And what edge it has, will, it will hold much longer than a steel tool. So when your edge gets dull, you simply loosen the bolt, rotate the head, and you get a fresh edge to turn with. The disadvantage is that it's a scraper and it does not leave a very good surface on the wood. You're gonna wind up sanding more and you're gonna wind up more doing more follow-up work after a carbide tool. Um, the rule of thumb that I've found is that you don't come within a quarter or three eighths of an inch of the final, di of the final dimension because the micro tear out beneath that carbide cut surface goes so deep, you're gonna lose that quarter of an inch just cleaning it up. Now, I don't know who said this. Actually, I may have said this. Every tool is really good at something. Carbide tools are, are good for, not good for things that need a high quality surface, but for rough turning, they're gonna really be very useful. Carbide roughing tools move wood very efficiently. In fact, this little round tool is how I uh, clear out the center of most of the bowls that I turn. You can go at it with, with weight and force and it will stand up just fine. Just make sure you stop in time to, to leave yourself enough room to clean up the wood after the carbide tool. Now, another variety of, of tool that's come out fairly recently, probably 15 years ago, uses a carbide ring 
Now this is a cutter. This is not a scraper. Um, they cut with this ring edge and you can find this carbide ring cutting mechanism on just about any kind of tool you're looking for. They leave a good surface. And again, no sharpening is necessary. You simply loosen the bolt and rotate the ring to find a sharp, sharp place on the ring. When you've used up the ring, it costs 10 to 20 bucks to replace it, depending on the size. So the hunter tools um, can be used for just about anything we've seen so far. There's not really a good round, uh, square to round hunter tool, but my favorite hollowing tools use this mechanism of cutting. Um, they cut very smoothly and very cleanly. So there are lots of choices for the new turner. My advice is start small. Add tools as your interest and expertise grows. And that, that's up to you how fast it's going to grow. All right. Thanks, Mike. Any questions? Uh, any questions? Well, now that you got your lathe and you got your tools, as I said at the beginning, the tools, even if they came sharp, would not stay sharp very long. And the tools usually do not come sharp. So Dave's going to walk us through how to uh, sharpen your tools. Okay. There we go. And let me go to slideshow mode here. Okay, so this is my this is my first slide. Are, are we all with the yep. proper good. turning station? Okay. Yeah. So I've been a turner for about 10 years now, but five years seriously. And I went through the, I didn't buy any Chinese tools, Mike. And I didn't even know Mike then, but I had, but I knew enough about steel, but I did buy just two or three tools. And I bought this basic grinder system at Woodcraft. I think the grinder itself was about 80 bucks. And I would buy a better grinder now if I was to replace this, but I've had it for 10 years and it's a 1750. Uh, I think if you spent maybe three or four times the $80, you could get a, a grinding wheel that was smoother, uh, better balanced and so on. But for all purposes, this one turns just fine. Uh, even Stuart Batty agreed when he taught his course at our place um, that it was fine for what we do. So um, I'm gonna talk mostly about sharpening and you need a station. This is the one I built. Uh, it evolved over time as my needs evolved. I keep it right close to the lathe. It's on wheels. I can move it around a little if I need to. And I like the Wolverine system from One Way, which is shown here. And the system, the grinding wheel, uh, the whole, and, and the accessories, the whole thing can be bought uh, with aluminum oxide wheels for three, I think I was about 300 bucks by the time I was done. And yeah, maybe a little bit more today. But uh, it's a very, very satisfactory system with great flexibility. And I've added a few gizmos along the way uh, as inevitably happens. Uh, but this, I think the biggest advantage I've found is to have a station like this, not just a grinder, but a station where you've got drawers to put your, all of your measuring devices and accessories in, and it's close at hand. It's, I literally pivot uh, from the lathe when I'm working and the station is right there with a good light over it. So, uh, and I got this, uh, bottom statement from Mike, sharpen early and sharpen often. There's nothing uh, more dangerous than a dull tool, frankly, because you let it get dull, you push too hard, it slips, something could happen. When we talk about grinding wheels, um, there's a great variety of wheels to choose from. Aluminum oxide is usually what you'll get with a grinder. Um, there are many different sharpening uh, uh, these are, these are aluminum oxide, some are ceramic, but there are uh, uh, many different hardness ratings for our kinds of tools, for the high-speed steel tools, the J hardness rating is really ideal. Uh, I, J, and K in the range are all okay, but J is just about perfect. These are economically priced. 
uh, an eight inch wheel, which is the most commonly used is usually 40 to $60, a good price range of about 50 bucks. They will wear down with use because you're grinding, the, wh the wheel is grinding itself away as it grinds the steel, uh, thus reducing the diameter. So you have to be aware of that and adjust your fixtures and tools accordingly, or your angles will change on the nose of your tools. They must be dressed and trued, squared up occasionally. Um, but overall, they're a great value uh, for what they do. In recent years, the cubic boron nitride wheels or CBNs as they're commonly called, uh, have really uh, begun to take center stage. They're about three times the money, but that you get at least a 10 year life. I've had one for five years and you can't tell the difference. They're machined, they're well balanced, they're very smooth running. Uh, they don't wear uh, because the, the uh, particles that are bonded onto the wheels are so hard. Uh, only the metal comes off of the wheel when the metal on your tool comes off when you're grinding. So they essentially have a constant diameter for the life of the wheel. Theoretically, it's gonna change a little, but nothing you could ever measure. Therefore, they don't, because they're that way, they don't uh, need to be dressed. In fact, if you tried to dress this wheel, uh, you would ruin it. Um, they run very cool. So when you're grinding with a tool, you don't see any sparks. The metal is coming off the tool, but it's cool enough that it doesn't get red hot and glow. So you, you literally can't see the sparks. Um, as I say in our training course, when you can afford it, it's very, very good value to step up to CBN wheels. So Mike's given you uh, the selection of tools we use. We'll talk about how to sharpen these various tools. Uh, same, the roughing gouge is a little bit unique, the skews, the spindle and detail gouges and the party tools. It's a good, good variety of tools out there. So bowl gouges, and scrapers uh, are the tools that we go to for making bowls. Tools that, uh, I missed a slide there, I think. When we, when we talk about tools, uh, we, we go to the grinder and we either use a platform, as you can see in these pictures, or we use a, a fixture. For, part, for the tools that are gonna be sharpened on a platform, the parting tool, the skew, spindle roughing gouge. Uh, these, you just set the angle of the platform to what's appropriate. And then you literally, in the case of the spindle gouge where I'm pointing now, you just roll that straight across. Your, your tool is, is uh, straight up and down on the platform. So you're cutting a 90 degree straight edge right around that curve. And typically you'd go in there at about a 45 degree angle on the platform. Parting tool. Same basic, you set the angle on the platform and then you sharpen one side, you turn it over and sharpen the other. <coughs> the skew also uses a platform for sharpening. When we go to scrapers, uh, they're sharpened on, on the platform as well. And we use a, uh, an appropriate nose angle by adjusting the platform. And then you create a burr. Um, as the wheel sharpens the metal, it also tends to build up this little edge. If you see over in the, where the yellow arrow points, you'll actually get a little burr, a little buildup of metal that builds up there. <coughs> Pardon me. After you've ground the edge and got the angle you want, then it's best to go after this with a burnishing tool. You can either use a handheld or a, or a, a bench mounted one here, which is my preference and you just roll that edge across this tapered pin, which is very hard. It's, it's metal that is harder than your tool and it, uh, it just cleans up and, and really sharpens that burr into a nice cutting edge. When you go after the gouges, either the bowl gouge or the spindle gouges, you have to approach things differently because as Mike pointed out, you've got a three dimensional cutting edge that follows that curve around through the flute and up onto the wings. So the fixture that is, is best suited for that, and there are varieties and different brands. This happens to be the Wolverine, uh, what they call the Varigrind gouge jig. 
And they're, in fact, they have different varieties within the Wolverine family. But this is the one that I happen to use and it's very common. So you, you fix it in the, in the jig and then you hold it up against the wheel and uh, you use other fixtures to set the angles and such that we don't need to get into. And then you rotate the gouge around on the wheel and it gives you this nice curve and it's a smooth edge all the way around. <coughs> As we talk about wood turning, or if you watch the hundreds of videos um, about what angle should you have, um, it really comes down to ultimately you have to decide what you like best and what works best for you. So as, as Mike said, you have two people, you get three opinions. But there are some rules of thumb that I've found uh, and I've tried to just summarize quickly. This, this, by the way, is a very common tool we use. Uh, you might use it in your, your, for sharpening plane blades and checking angles, but this is a little uh, tool that's handy to have in your, in your sharpening chest. So the spindle roughing gouge, as I said before, about 45 degrees is very common, works very well. Spindle gouges, somewhere between 25 and 40 degrees, 35 is common. Um, bowl gouges, 50 degrees is a good, uh, very versatile tool. Parting tool, 45 degrees, both sides. <coughs> Pardon me, just getting over a cough here. Scrapers at about 75 degrees, in theory, you can do it. Anything that's less than 90, uh, 60 to 75 is, is where I usually try to stay and it works very well. And then a skew angle, again, it's an, an inclusive angle is 35 degrees. Um, could be 40, could be 25, it just depends on, on the kind of edge and the edge length that you want. So we all experiment with these angles as we learn, try different things and my personal favorite bowl gouge is actually a 40 degree, um, but it doesn't work for everything. I also have a 50 and I have an, a 65. So you'll, as you get, as your skill level increases, you'll add more tools to your, to your weapons list and they'll have different characteristics as, as you come to appreciate what they can do for you. So if you go out and, and you buy a new tool, um, as I think Mike said, they don't, they don't come out of the box ready for you to use very often. Some do, but you should have the opinion that you will always sharpen the cutting edge, even on a new tool. <coughs> My apologies. Sharpening is a very individual thing and uh, they really don't intend that you're gonna use it out of the box the way they do it. So um, you have to learn enough about it to figure out the nose angle you want, the, the wing length you want, and you learn all this by trial and error and by talking with others and, and by practicing and, and just using them. If you go to buy a used tool, uh, which I've done, um, most of the time I, I reshape them to what I want them to be. And, uh, and, and it's whatever configuration you need. You can take any bowl gouge for the most part and make it and to a, a number of different configurations on the, uh, as far as the nose angle and the wing length and so on, it's just what you want. Um, and as Mike said, when you're buying used tools, stick with the good brand names, the English and American steels uh, from the known makers. <coughs> and I'll third the motion that wood turning is great fun. It's great therapy for the soul. Um, I, I retired when I got my lathe, it was a retirement gift. And I have found that I walk by my table saw and all my other furniture making tools now pretty much most of the time just to get to the lathe. I use my big cabinet makers table saw as a table now to put my lathe tools on. It's challenging and I like the fact that no matter how good you think you're getting, there's always a next level to reach for and to strive for a higher level of achievement and skill. We learn, we're a very giving bunch of guys. We, we make a lot of things just to give away for charity purposes or just for good friendship. We create, we laugh, we bond. It's a very strong organization and we hope you come to join us.
So where are you going to spend your money? Local retailers, uh, they're pretty good. Rockler, Woodcraft, Woodcrafters, they're all, they usually have a, a, at least one expert there that can help you. They carry the main brands of lathes and tool supplies like Sorby tools and so on. Uh, they all offer the 10% uh, guild discount for, uh, for tools. Uh, so those are, are good uh, standby for sure. Um, but there's a, a lot of online suppliers and um, these are just a, a few that uh, a lot of us use. You can go, uh, these three are pretty much, a, a huge, they offer pretty much everything. So they're a one, one stop shop craft supplies. Uh, they probably have the most complete site uh, list of, of products. They also have the big blades, the robust, the powermatics, the big marks, jet, one way. So if you're looking, get to a point where you're looking at a big lathe, you know, the Rocklers and Woodcrafts aren't going to uh, handle these kind of machines. They're expensive, they're big, they're heavy, and so on. But um, Craft Supplies, Packard, and uh, Penn State Industries, it's more of a, uh, they offer more cost-effective tools, but they have, they sort of got into the business by offering just about every pen kit in the world. And um, they offer, they do offer tools. They offer their own lathe. I would put them in the uh, the mid range, more cost effective tools. But uh, certainly check them out. Um, there's a lot of specialty suppliers uh, for turning tools. Uh, as Mike said, you know the Sorby tools and uh, Woodcraft. They those are available at. Uh, the local stores. D-Way tools and Thompson tools are very, 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 very good, good tools. Um, D-Way, they're an excellent vendor. They're uh, just north of us up in Washington. They, uh, they're highly recommended. Uh, I've got uh, a lot of their tools and as well as other club members. Thompson is another very well-known uh, tool maker. So you can check them out uh, when you want something uh, especially, they're a little more expensive than the Sorbies and so on, but they're excellent tools. As Dave talked about sharpening uh, CBN wheels, wood turning wonders, they've just come on the market with a, a wide variety of CBN wheels. And uh, if you consider CBN wheels, they would be the first place I would go taking a look at. Um, good prices, uh, good company. Uh, finishing. Uh, there's a company, local company called Doctor's Workshop, uh, Woodshop. Uh, and the doctor happens to be Mike Meredith, who uh, uh, you heard from today. His, he has a, a wide variety of, of uh, walnut oil combinations, waxes and polishes. Uh, it's, it's, I'll, I'll give him the, the, uh, the plug here. Uh, a lot of us, we just use uh, his finishing stuff. And on his work, on his uh, website, he's got a lot of videos on how to use it and how to finish uh, products with uh, with his products. So uh, his products are available at Woodcraft. Uh, get your ten percent discount with uh, either our uh, club or the Guilds Club uh, membership. Speaking of clubs, uh, we hope you consider joining Northwest. Uh, we have a series of beginner classes that we've given, we've put on over this last year for sharpening, for uh, beginning bowl turning uh, and spindle turning. We have monthly demos. We have a YouTube channel there. We have uh, right now 41 um, demonstration videos that are available on that that you can watch at your leisure. We also have a, 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 a consumer, uh, our own store where we buy consumables like uh, sanding paper, wood sealer, wood, and um, we buy them in quantity and then split it up and sell it to our members pretty much at cost. Uh, it is a, it's not something that we make money on. It's something we pass on the, uh, the best price we can to our members. Uh, we also have like the guild discounts at Rockler, Woodcraft, Woodcrafters. We also have signed up with Klingspore, so you can uh, uh, log into Klingspore 
and get a, get their club discount as well as Penn State. Uh, we also have a monthly churning talk on a Saturday morning. We spend an hour. Uh, anyone who logs into a, a Zoom session, we spend an hour. Just it's just a free form discussion thing on turning topics. Anything is is up up for a discussion, and the hour go, always goes fast. It's just it's amazing. Some of the things that we that come up and we can talk about forever. Uh, we also now have an open shop thanks to Dave Wood. Uh, once a month, we have seven laid that you can just come in Saturday morning and there'll be some club members there that will help you out with uh, anything. Uh, if you're a beginner, perfect. Uh, we'll help you in whatever you want. Uh, or uh, for whatever reason, a more advanced turner, uh, you're welcome to come in and, and we'll just... Uh, you can turn or you can talk or whatever you want. We also have wood cutting parties when uh, down trees come available. Uh, we get notified and sometimes we'll get a group of people and just go out and cut the tree down, cut the tree. Uh, down trees have to be cut uh, in a special way to make the wood uh, usable for Turner and we can help you do that as I, as I said earlier as soon as that wood is cut uh, we seal it and um, divvy it up amongst whoever wants it and as Mike said we have our annual auction and barbecue uh, August 7th uh, join the club uh, the auction is usually a, a lot of it's a fun event and usually a really great bargain especially on wood so um, Give us a shot. If you're uh, on the east side of Portland, you might want to look at Cascade Wood Turners. If you're uh, living across the river in, in Vancouver, uh, there's a club up there. Um, and one thing about churning uh, that I wish the, uh, the guild had access to is that there's an international organization called uh, uh, the AAW, the American Association of Wood Turners. It's, it's a fantastic resource. Uh, not very expensive to join. They have an annual symposium where they bring in master wood turners and give uh, you know days and days of uh, demonstrations. We had one here in Portland uh, three years ago, I think it was, at the convention center. Uh, they publish a high end, a very high end monthly magazine. They have lots of training material, and it really is an incredible organization. So, bottom line, if you're interested in turning, join a club, uh, learn from people that already made all the mistakes you can make in wood turning, so you don't have to make them, and um, we hope you come join us and have fun. So. Great, Roger. I think we're done. <laughs>